Good evening, um, everybody, and welcome to the Canadian Mental Health Association's uh, BC Division hosted All Candidates Forum. Tonight, the forum is focused on mental health care, wellness, and dignity for BC's recovery. My name is Johnny Morris, and I have the privilege and honor of serving CMHA BC as the CEO. And I'm joined tonight by our Director of Policy, who you'll meet in a few moments, Amelia Hamfelt. This evening, I'm joining you from the unceded and ancestral Coast Salish territory of the Lekwungen and Wasanic nations. I invite each of you, as you listen in on the debate virtually this evening, to acknowledge and reflect upon the territories from which you're joining us. CMHA is one of the most established national charitable organizations in Canada, and we've been providing service in British Columbia since 1952. We hold a vision of mentally healthy people in a healthy society and strive for a mission of mental health for all. Our provincial office provides province-wide programs and policy leadership alongside 14 branches serving over 100 communities to meet local need. Tonight's discussion has attracted over two, well, we had 240 people register for tonight's uh, discussion. This is incredible and symbolizes how critically important it is that discussion and commitments about mental health and addictions take place in the lead up to October 24th, 2020 and beyond. Joining us tonight in the audience are people with lived and living experience, family members and loved ones and service providers. And I think it's safe to assume that many of us, if not all of us convened here this evening are impacted directly or indirectly by mental health and substance use problems. It underscores such an important opportunity for us to debate the path ahead and the moral imperative of sustained action in service of mental health for all. Tonight's debate takes place at a critical juncture. My colleague Louise Bradley, the president and CEO of the Mental Health Commission of Canada, recently said, a physical pandemic has highlighted a crying need as vast and diverse as the nation we call home. In this brief window of time, a veritable blink of an eye in policy development, an onslaught of innovations and interventions have arisen from a collective will mobilized by the eye-opening realization that protecting our bodies from harm is only half the battle. Our recent research, our own recent research completed with UBC shows that almost 40% of people say that their mental health has declined due to COVID-19, with people already struggling with their mental health twice as likely to be most hard hit. Communities continue to experience increasing and devastated losses of people due to a toxic drug supply and overdose deaths. And just today, CMHABC released polling figures that shows that a striking majority, 87% of British Columbians, believe that many of their fellow community members do not have access to necessary mental health services and support. Tonight's debate is critically important, and the commitments that underpin the policy direction of whomever forms the next government in this province are critically important too, given the juncture we find ourselves at. On the screen in front of you, you will see the schedule for tonight's debate. Amelia is gonna pop that up there. We will start proceedings with two perspectives from the community to assist in setting some important context. We'll then meet our moderator, our independent moderator for the evening, Moira Witten, health reporter with the TIE. Moira will moderate the debate among the three candidates joining us this evening. Mitzi Dean from the BC NDP, Scott Bernstein from the BC Greens, and Jane Thornthwaite from the BC Liberals. Moira has developed a series of questions across three themes this evening, care before crisis, foundations of wellness and dignity always, sourced from her own practice as a journalist and from members of the community. Thank you so much to Moira and the TAI for all of your support in making tonight's debate possible. Throughout the evening, um, after Moira was um, facilitated the debate amongst the three candidates, and you'll be able to hear each of them uh, respond to those questions um, about their platforms and their commitments to mental health and addictions. Um, there are 20 minutes at the end of this evening allocated for audience questions. Audience members should use the Q&A function in Zoom. It's at the bottom of your screen to write in any questions that you may have during the broadcast and the team behind the scenes will route those questions uh, to the moderator. We likely won't have time to answer all of those questions this evening, but we do invite you to write in with those questions. 
Please be clear with your question and identify if you'd like it to go to a particular candidate or to all panelists. I'd like to make two final comments before I hand things over to Amelia. First, civility and respect are fundamental to psychological safety in any context, and that includes all candidate forums. We hold this commitment throughout this evening at CMHA, and whether you're a candidate or an audience member, please hold that commitment alongside us too. And second, the issues at the heart of the debate tonight are impactful. I noted previously that it's safe to assume all of us are directly or indirectly affected by the issues at the heart of this debate. Please take good care of yourself and one another throughout. We'll be profiling a set of resources at the end of this evening, um, should you wish to reach out. Now, I'd like to hand things over to Amelia Hamfelt, Director of Policy at CMHABC, for some further opening remarks. Thank you, Johnny. I'd really just like to take a moment to foreground the issues that Johnny raised and the reason why we're all in this room tonight. We have seen the pandemic and the overdose epidemic have really substantial impacts on mental health and substance use, and they've impacted populations disproportionately, with people already facing health and social inequities experiencing the worst of this. And we know this is connected to the economic downturn that research tells us that an increase in unemployment rate increases the risk of suicide and other substance use related deaths. And we see that in the climbing overdose death rates. Just this month in September, 127 overdoses took place and those people have passed away. And so we have a large crisis on our hands that need immediate action. And this election is an opportunity to start to look towards what some of those solutions may be. So CMHABC, uh, soon after the election was called, put out our election platform. And it's broken into two components. The first of which we're calling our guiding principles that we want politicians to commit to, to guarantee that the mental health of British Columbians is the foundation for our province's recovery. We want to see bold leadership and have the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions lead a coordinated response to the mental health and substance use impacts of the pandemic and do so in partnership with community by convening a cross-sector task force. We want to see increased investment, two billion going into mental health and substance use services that are delivered by health authorities, ministries, and community. We want to see established accountability and an independent mental health advocate who reports directly to the legislature that monitors the performance of services and hears complaints from people who are accessing those services. And then of course, we need an equity lens throughout this. With regards to investments, we want to see targeted funding for services and supports provided by and for underserved communities. These guiding principles then inform each of the immediate actions that we specify. And now I'm not going to go through and list all of them. There is the full document on our website, getloudbc.ca, but I do want to point you to the three areas in which the actions are grouped. The first of which is care before crisis. So that's looking at our healthcare system and ensuring that everybody throughout the province, no matter who they are or where they are, can access care at the first sign of illness. The second is foundations for wellness. And this is ensuring everyone has the essentials they need to be well. So that includes a sufficient income, safe and secure housing, food security, and access to digital services. The third is dignity always. This is knowing that when people are experiencing a mental health crisis, that they have access to compassionate, culturally safe health care, and that policing and involuntary detention are used safely and with respect to human rights. And you'll notice here that each of these areas aligns with the agenda that Johnny introduced. The Kenneth's discussion is going to move through these three topics this evening. And lastly, I would just like to say that CMHA's advocacy efforts are rooted in community. We are supported by a number of people who have stood behind us since the 2017 election when we launched the Before Stage 4 campaign. This group that we call our Get Loud supporters um, is composed of people with lived and living experience, their families, community service providers, mental health clinicians, policymakers, and more. And these individuals have amplified our message of mental health for all by posting on social media, contacting their candidates, sharing their stories, and encouraging others to do the same. 
we want to thank them for sticking alongside us and also for attending tonight and for contributing to the question set. I now have the pleasure of introducing our nonprofit leaders for the Community Voice presentation. Each of them will share what they're witnessing within their communities during the dual public health emergencies, how they and other service providers have responded to rising and changing needs, and what they need our new government to do to address both urgent and long-standing issues within their communities. Brenda Platt is the Executive Director of Turning Point Recovery Society and has been since 2005. She has over 35 years of experience in the nonprofit sector, specializing in addictions, mental health, and domestic violence. Brenda is a graduate of the University of British Columbia and licensed as a certified substance use abuse counselor and certified addictions program administrator in both Canada and the United States. She currently chairs the newly formed nonprofit, BC Addiction Recovery Association. In addition, Brenda is a recipient of the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal in recognition of her service and commitment to the citizens of British Columbia and for her tireless dedication and work in the fields of addiction services, mental health, and domestic violence. Brenda has also been honored with the Val Anderson Humanitarian Award, which recognizes enormous kindnesses extended towards fellow British Columbians. The award was presented to Brenda by then Premier Christy Clark. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you very much, Amelia. It's a pleasure to be here. Am I unmuted now? I'm, I, I'm unmuted. Uh, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight, and thanks for inviting me. Um, and welcome to everybody. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge that uh, I speak tonight on two fronts, partly as the Executive Director of Turning Point Recovery Society, and also, as uh, Amelia said, the Chair of the BC Addiction Recovery Association. Um, we are, uh, both of those entities are fully supportive of the uh, initiatives that are being put forth by CMHA. And uh, I'm gonna add some of our own commentary on what we're hoping to see and how we've been impacted by the dual health crises. Um, uh, of course, I'm sure you can appreciate it. it was devastating today to see we've had yet another 127 uh, overdose deaths in the month of September. Um, we're surprised that we haven't seen this be more of an election issue. Four people a day, uh, average over four people a day, uh, died in the month of September from the toxic drug supply and from overdoses. And we just have not felt like we've been hearing enough about it. Um, the impact of the dual health crisis on residential services uh, and even in our outpatient programs has been uh, significant. In addition to lost revenue because of uh, protocols we've had to put into place to ensure uh, safe social distancing, our revenues have been decreased um, and we've had an increase in the complexities of the clients we're serving, which is not specific to COVID, but partly related to COVID is we're seeing a lot more people with uh, increased depression and anxiety. Our programming has had to change to go to an almost completely virtual model. Uh, which has been a significant impact um, in terms of morale. A big part of the level of care we provide is about helping people transition into community and build support networks in the community as they're transitioning out of residential care. And of course, they haven't been able to do that in the same capacity that uh, they have in the past. At Turning Point, we operate a continuum of care. We have a drop-in center, we have an outreach program, we have a residential program, we have a very comprehensive aftercare program, we operate supportive and affordable housing. We have also been, rec more recently since COVID, we've been running an emergency response center in Richmond. Our continuum of care is showing the promise that we thought it would, which is at three and a half years, we have a 90% success rate. Most of the people that are living in our affordable housing that are participating in our aftercare program came to us by literally walking into our drop-in center, desperate, asking for help and needing direction on how to access services. So we think this is an innovative model. We believe that this is a model that can work and we're seeking support to in encourage more development of models of care like this. So we are very supportive of what CMHA has put forward in terms of a comprehensive continuum of recovery-oriented care and services. 
what we have, my experience has been, and I sound so old listening to Amelia, but my experience has been that we tend to operate in silos. We have a lot of individual solutions, but there's no comprehensive solution. And so what we're seeing is this increased stigma around abstinence or increased stigma around harm reduction. We believe that the continuum of care has to be inclusive of all interventions and not be um, just harm reduction or just uh, all the way up to abstinence-based programs. And that those things can coexist and that it needs to be well thought out and, and uh, organized. And we have yet to see this uh, in the last decade, really. And so we also need to see an acknowledgement of the complexities of the clients we served. In the 15 years I've been at Turning Point, we've gone from relatively low percentages, 15% of people with dual diagnoses and concurrent disorders to 85% of our clients now have dual diagnoses. So we're also looking for some acknowledgement and funding to support the complexities of the clients we served. We also believe it's a healthcare issue, not a welfare state issue, and we'd like to see that movement happen as well. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. I'll now introduce our next community voice presenter. Ingrid Mendez de Cruz is Watari's executive director. Before taking up this role in 2018, she served as Watari's Latin American drug and alcohol counselor for 20 years. A lifelong volunteer, she brought her commitment to inclusivity and social justice from her Guatemala place of many trees to Turtle Island in 1990. When Ingrid arrived in Vancouver, she saw the need for supportive networks between newcomers like herself and existing communities in her new home. She started building relationships that, over two decades later, remain integral to the supportive programming at Watari. Welcome, Ingrid. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Um, thank you for having me. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm, uh, I'm thankful um, to speak to you from the territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Moskin um, Coast Salish territories um, that were colonized and stolen lands as well. Um, and uh, from what um, Emilia was saying that we were going to speak to, what we're seeing out there right now during the pandemic, um, as a community-based organization, um, we see uh, people who are struggling with um, not only their mental health and addictions, but housing, um, food, many other things, especially for communities that are invisible, that are here with precarious immigration status or non-status, that they themselves feel invisible to not only um, the provincial government, the federal government, municipal government. Um, they, don't, they don't have access to services and supports um, because of their precarious immigration status. Um, they, their mental health um, has um, tripled in, in, in the sense of um, depression, uh, um, fear. Um, they, they don't really know what's going to happen with them. Um, we were very um, concerned that many of them were going to end up being on house. And we had to um, ask support from foundations and individual donors to help us um, support these communities um, with rent and some other uh, needs and supports that they needed. Um, we also support migrant workers uh, who come here um, to this province and uh, support our food systems. Um, they are the ones who um, help us uh, or help the, the British Columbia getting the food that we eat, and, uh, but they are also known seen um, by um, the system. They are um, victims of systemic um, racism in the farms where they work. Um, they are victims of systemic racism in the uh, communities where they work, and they cannot they uh, they cannot access uh, supports. Their mental health has been um, devastating for them, um, and also addictions. Uh, we have had cases of um, 
people um, drinking um, in their uh, workplaces because of how difficult it is for um, migrant workers to come here and leave their families behind, not knowing what's going to happen, especially now during the pandemic, um, not knowing what's going to happen with them and if they are going to find them alive or not. Um, we see women who are fleeing violence, um, children who are fleeing violence um, in their own countries that come here or and they uh, have to experience um, many of the same issues that um, the other populations face, but with lack of supports and, and lack of um, access to services. So we would um, really like to see um, an approach and on how to support these communities, these invisible communities that nobody sees, nobody cares, nobody looks for. Um, we wanna see how um, government uh, is gonna continue this support support to them or start supporting them, but on longer term, not shorter term, um, how we can um, make sure that them being our neighbors are going to have the same access to all services and supports, uh, not only around mental health, but also um, uh, health in general, to housing, to um, having food, um, having access to all the all the different uh, supports that um, both federal and provincial government had out there for everyone else uh, in the different communities so these invisible communities need help and need support and we want to see that with the with the next government and uh, we also support the platform that's image uh, that um, um, uh, mental, mental health um, um, the BC Mental Health Association has as well. So thank you uh, for having me and um, I'll, uh, I'll stay and, and hear the remarks from the candidates. Thank you again. Um, a heartfelt thank you from uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association to both Brenda and Ingrid for um, situating um, the community perspective on the some of the key issues. Uh, related to mental health and substance use and the impacts across diverse communities here in BC. Um, thank you very much indeed for, for bringing forth your perspectives and, and adding into the conversation um, some of the calls that your organizations are making for inclusion in, in the platforms. We're at a key pivot now in um, this evening's event. We've, we've got um, a, a, a significant number of attendees here listening in on the conversation. Um, I do want to appreciate that a number of uh, CMHA's board members are also on the line here too this evening. Um, I want to turn to Moira now. Uh, so Moira, um, if you turn on your camera and, and, um, and get ready. Uh, Moira is um, um, our independent uh, moderator this evening. Uh, uh, Moira is the health reporter for the TIE, as I mentioned before. Um, CMHA is a nonpartisan organization, um, and that's key to our mandate. Um, and so um, each time we've done these, we've invited in an independent moderator who brings a set of questions um, to interrogate um, the platform commitments and uh, the positions of the parties here, um, and to ensure um, a fair and equitable and democratic conversation uh, amongst um, the participants. So. Um, we deeply appreciate all of the care and diligence and rigor, uh, Moira, that you've brought to this and, and the support of, of uh, the TAI. Um, I'm going to hand things over to you as our moderator. Welcome. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Johnny. Um, and good evening, guests and panelists. Um, I want to first start by acknowledging that I'm joining you here tonight from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam peoples, um, and that our conversation tonight takes place amid ongoing colonial violence against many Indigenous peoples across Canada and around the world, uh, including towards the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia. I'm joined here tonight by Jane Thornthwaite of the BC Liberals, Scott Bernstein, of the BC Greens and Mitzi Dean representing the BC New Democratic Party. But tonight's forum isn't about rehashing previous records. Um, we're trying to platform a lively discussion on bold solutions needed in the future of mental health care and substance use in BC. Um, and as we interrogate those, uh, those strategies, I want to acknowledge that myself and the three candidates on your screen tonight are all white settlers. And with that in mind, the questions you'll hear tonight are rooted in the lived experiences of people with mental health challenges across BC 
um, and many have been informed by research and advocacy work related to the intersections of mental health with race, with colonialism, income and disability, uh, and by experts in indigenous mental health um, and ways of care in BC. You'll for, for the run of show tonight, you'll soon hear from each candidate in a two minute opening statement. The order has been chosen by random draw. Then we will be asking about nine questions total that are directed at the candidates, about three per. Um, and the candidate to whom the question is directed will have two minutes to respond uninterrupted after which will be followed by two minutes of response and rebuttal time for the other two candidates. This is a little bit more free flowing, but I'll ensure that speaking time is equitable and that this first responder is chosen at random. Uh, and then finally, once we've gotten through the debate at 8.30, we'll have a 20 minute Q&A portion, as Johnny mentioned. Uh, so please do submit your questions um, to, through the Zoom Q&A function so we can ask them. And after the Q&A, we'll hear from candidates for a final two minute closing statement in a reverse order uh, from their opening statements. And Johnny Morris, who you just recently heard from, will round out the evening with closing remarks. With that, uh, let's start with opening statements. The order was chosen right before the um, event began tonight. Ms. Dean, over to you. Thank you, Moira. I'd like to honor and recognize that I'm talking to you tonight from the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people. Thank you so much to Brenda and Ingrid uh, for all of your work. So many of us are struggling with our mental health right now. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, people across British Columbia are living with isolation and loneliness, financial concerns, and a fear of getting sick. People are worried about their families, about their future. Now more than ever, we need supportive services that are there for people when they need them. And that's what a re-elected BC NDP government is committed to do. Before the pandemic hit, we were improving services to help people dealing with mental health and addiction struggles, from prevention and harm reduction to treatment and recovery. When we formed government, we created a standalone ministry for mental health and addictions. We were starting to see promising signs in our work to stem the overdose crisis, but we know that the pandemic has had devastating impacts. My heart goes out to everyone who has lost a loved one during both health emergencies. My deepest gratitude goes to everyone working on the front lines. One death is too many. We're working on all fronts and we're not going to let up. Thank you. Thank you, Mitzi. We'll now hear from Ms. Thornthwaite. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to the organizers for um, organizing this forum, as well as all the people that are on the screen that, of course, I can't see, but are obviously listening in, and all of their work that they do uh, for those that struggle with mental health and or addictions. I appreciate your work and uh, wish you all of the best. Um, my acknowledgement is that I too am sitting here on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, as you might know, I actually have a background in healthcare. I'm a registered dietitian, and I'm very, very proud of the work that I've been doing in numerous capacities over the years to assist people with mental health and addictions. I. Uh, first became a parliamentary secretary for uh, child and youth mental health and anti-bullying, as well as chair of the Select Standing Committee for Children and Youth when, we, when the BC Liberals were in government. Then we embarked on a very comprehensive reporting report uh, that actually took two years. We thought it was going to take six months. And this is a, this is a, uh, a, a nonpartisan committee. And uh, we came up with many recommendations that both our government had adopted, Foundry being one of the key for children and youth, but also this new government also adopted a uh, standalone minister. So I was very pleased that, uh, and there were other ones that were adopted as well. I have um, my entire political life um, represented, sorry? To, oh, 20 seconds. Okay, um, those most vulnerable people. And I look forward to um, discussing, discussing more of uh, our platform. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, and last but not least, Mr. Bernstein. Well, 
Well, thank you uh, very much. I'm, I'm really honored to be here tonight and thank you all uh, for the organizers and for uh, my fellow candidates and for you watching. Um, I, I also am a white settler on, settler on unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Um, my background is I'm, um, I'm currently running in Vancouver Kingsway as a BC Green candidate. And um, I, I've uh, began, I have a background as a master's in environmental studies, but I've been working in uh, the drug policy field for 13 years where I started as a law student and began working on the Insight uh, legal case defending North America's first supervised consumption site. I ended up working on that legal case as a, as a law student and then a lawyer and ultimately uh, became a lawyer with Pivot Legal Society advocating for the legal rights of marginalized drug users uh, in, in the province and in Canada. Um, currently I'm working as the Director of Policy at the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition advocating for um, drug policies based on human rights, social inclusion, and public health. Uh, the BC Greens are fully supportive. I, I am really, uh, I, I agree with the disturbing facts around mental health and with the pandemic, and I think we need to address that. But more largely, uh, that mental health is an issue that intersects across all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of areas of housing and food security and the overdose crisis. And we, we're committed to uh, prioritizing the mental health and the overdose crisis, uh, as well as creating a green and sustainable future that includes uh, supports for community-based mental health initiatives. Uh, and so uh, we're uh, working to improve access to mental health services and strengthen communities uh, to provide and help and help each other um, and help provide support for people who need mental health services and doing this in uh, with a lens towards equity and fairness, inclusion of uh, people with lived and living experience in the decision making about that. Thank you, Scott. Wonderful. So with that, let's jump right into our first segment, which is on care before crisis. Mr. Bernstein, you're running against Adrian Dix in the former health minister's own riding due to what you say is his government's poor response to the overdose crisis. The Greens platform's focus is on scaling up the response through a number of means that have proven relatively difficult according to the NDP government. Imagine you're the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions and it's your first day. What is the first thing you do differently from before? Yes, thank you. So I, I actually ran, uh, I ran on this, um, in this election to bring a, raise awareness to the overdose crisis and the failed response, uh, in my opinion, of the NDP um, uh, to, to this. I, I think the first thing we need to do is we need to fully fund the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions. It's, it's shameful that's the lowest funded ministry in the province and even has a budget less than the Premier's own office. So we need to fund that. Um, that ministry uh, fully to provide services. Uh, Safe Supply has been a, um, a pilot project scale. We need to scale that up with more options for people uh, as well as more formats for people to, um, to receive pharmaceutical grade drugs. And thirdly, we need to urgently decriminalize um, drug possession. And so that's something that's sort of been uh, dickered around a bit by the, uh, the current government who says it's not the jurisdiction and ignored the report of Dr. Bonnie Henry calling for urgent decriminalization. That is something that we're gonna make a priority and we're gonna do it through getting an extension uh, through the, from Ottawa or amendments to the Police Act as Dr. Henry recommended. And, um, so uh, overall, our response needs to be scaled up. We need to create uh, more and better harm reduction services. And we also need to scale up treatment options. And I, and I agree there should be a full spectrum of options for people uh, wherever they are at uh, with their substance use. So we, we need to provide harm reduction to keep people alive, keep them well, and we need to do that in a way that's COVID safe, of course, uh, but without without uh, reducing uh, access. And so um, we, these re recent numbers of overdose are, are the telling indicator that I say that our, our current approach is not working and we need something different. Thank you. Um, who would like to speak first? Ms. Dean? 
Yeah, thank you so much. Well, in 2017, when we formed government, we immediately invested 332 million into the opioid crisis, increasing overdose prevention sites, increasing naloxone and increasing safer supply. And as I'm sure the candidate uh, is aware, in September, we made a significant announcement around safer supply of alternative prescription medications, uh, changing the criteria of access, so really improving access, and also in increasing the, the professionals who are able to make the prescription as well. We actually invest about $2.5 billion a year into mental health and addiction services, and we have created the Pathway to Hope, which is a 10-year plan. And we've been working with the federal government to try and decriminalize uh, drug supply. And our commitment in our platform is to continue that work, which Dr. Bonnie Henry says is the best outcome. We need to do that to reduce stigmatization. And we are also committing to, if that is not successful, creating a made in BC solution as well, because we do need to reduce that stigma and be able to provide those services. Thank you, Ms. Dean. Ms. Thornthwaite, would you like to reply? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the VC Liberal approach, um, we actually uh, agree that there are four pillars and harm reduction is one of the key pillars. Uh, but what we have fallen short of uh, is in all the other three pillars. And uh, I, I am, am dismayed that when I call um, uh, just random uh, addiction recovery facilities uh, in the Lower Mainland, and, and, and among the um, British Columbia, other cities, how many beds sit empty? And the reason why these beds sit empty is because government is not funding them. And I think I've mentioned before on one random day, a few months ago, I called nine of these facilities and there was 126 beds sitting empty. Immediately, we could open those beds if government would fund them. It wouldn't even cost any capital funding. But what we really need for long-term is a comprehensive mental health and addiction system. And after three years of having a separate ministry that we were all very much looking forward to the results, we are still without a comprehensive mental health and addiction system. There are still gaps. People can't get help when they want it, uh, even between certain levels of the system as far as moving from one, uh, one uh, state of care to the, to the next, there's gaps. And uh, it's unfortunate that people are following through, the, following through the cracks and the overdose deaths that we are seeing tragically right now is indicative of a very poor continuum of care. Thank you, Ms. Thornthwaite. Um, the next question is directed towards Ms. Dean. Um, this is a question actually that was written in from someone who's living in the north of, of BC. Uh, they say we have a six bed adolescent psych unit, this has all been fact checked, uh, to serve most of the entire northern half of the province and a wait list up to a year and a half for regular counseling services. Virtual health won't address the urgent need for youth and others who need inpatient care. And the NDP have said they would expand youth treatment beds and e-health care. What specifically will your party do to bridge these regional gaps in the short term for people of all ages? Well, thank you for the question. I'm so sorry to hear that you have such a long wait for mental health care. Uh, kids in my own community, when I was running mental health and substance use services before I was elected, uh, were also facing long waits as well. And that was because services in, uh, well, across the province, but especially in the community I was serving, have been cut. And in fact, even through the opioid crisis, youth beds were being cut by the BC Liberals. Uh, our commitment is that we are over doubling the number of youth beds and those beds will be available around the whole of the province. So the health authorities will be able to make applications and uh, will be able to speak to the needs of their communities. And at the same time, we are trying to build this system of continuous care and so that uh, people are able to access the kind, of care, the kind of care they want in the way that they want it and when they need it. When we formed government in 2017, even the provincial health officer said there was no system of mental health and addictions care. So in just three and a half years, we've, create, we've started to build that system of care and we have made some progress. And for example, with COVID, we've been able to increase those remote ways of, of people being able to connect with services and start to build relationships and start to find ways of recovery and healing and uh, being able to identify resources but you know, we have made progress, but we must keep going. There are still 
uh, many priorities across the whole of the province that we need to be working on. We have a 10 year pathway to hope plan. So we do want to be able to build the system so that it's fair and equitable. People have access across the whole of the province to those services that they need where and when they need them and that they're not stigmatizing as well and that people if they need to be able to access services in their communities that the capacity is there so we're increasing beds across the whole of the province we're focusing on under 24s and we are over doubling the amount of youth beds in the province too thank you thank you Ms. dean who would like to respond uh let's go to mr bernstein Yes, thank you. So access to mental health care and, and affordability of mental health care is, is a pressing concern. And our proposal is to commit $1 billion over four years to integrate mental health services into the MSP. And so this would allow uh, people to access mental health services much more readily. Um, it would be a very clear process of doing it and it would be paid for. And the d data shows many health um, mental health situations can be addressed through a, a small number of series of counseling uh, for, for people. Uh, we're also supporting integrated mental health services in communities. And so we um, are, want to create uh, community-based options that work with the local culture and the local systems in place to address, uh, address issues around youth mental health and adult mental health uh, in rural communities and First Nations communities and across uh, across the province. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Bernstein. Uh, Jane, it's to you. Yeah, I think um, with regards to the the issue about uh, Northern Health and and outside of Metro, uh, Northern Health has been particularly uh, traumatized by the overdose crisis. There's uh, was a higher number of deaths. Uh, per capita in Northern Health uh, from overdoses than anywhere else. So they are definitely suffering and the services are, are, are not there. I've, I spoke to a man uh, with a daughter uh, in Kamloops, for instance, Interior Health, and he could not get any help anywhere near Kamloops for his daughter who was suffering from mental health and addictions and also was being sex trafficked. And he would want to go and rescue her, um, but he couldn't because he would get arrested and uh, there, the system is not there to help these kids. And, and it, it goes to the prevention. And I, again, as I mentioned, uh, one of the four pillars is prevention and getting these, to these kids early in schools. Uh, it's too late at the age of 25. What, what we need is more services when the kids are five and just starting out school as opposed Thank to waiting too late. Okay. Thank you, Jane. Um, this actually, this goes into a, uh, my next question, uh, which is directed at you, Ms. Thornthwaite. Um, the BC Liberal platform for this election focuses on a, a lot on adding treatment bed spaces and preventative measures, like you just mentioned, um, as a solution to the overdose crisis. Um, but, people are, but many experts and people on the front lines are critical that these longer term solutions won't actually do anything in the short term to save lives or prevent deaths that we're seeing from the poisoned illicit drug uh, supply right now. What short-term solutions would a BC Liberal government pursue to prevent deaths from poison drugs? And would your government continue with the recently announced expansion of safer supply in the province if elected? Yeah, the BC, as I said, the BC Liberals um, support the four pillars and certainly safe supply is part of harm reduction. Uh, we're, not, we're not saying that uh, there are exclusive one size fit all solution. What we are saying is, is that there has to be uh, more emphasis on treatment and recovery because nobody seems to be talking about the recovery end of it. There are four pillars. We need to get people immediate access to treatment when they want it, when they're ready. And we don't have that right now. So certainly uh, when we have a perfect opportunity is when people are accessing these services like Insight or um, safe supply, that we have a perfect opportunity for health professionals to, to um, em embrace these individuals and help them on their journey. We know that addiction is, is a symptom. It's a symptom of pain or trauma, root causes, um, uh, sometimes um, intergenerational trauma. We need to get to these people and offer them solutions and help uh, right there when we have them. And right now we're not doing that. 
So our government would be supportive of bumping up the availability of these, these healthcare professionals when we have access to these individuals to help them through their continuing of care, continuum of care and getting to the root of addiction to hopefully eventually help them get well. Thank you. Um, Mitzi, would you like to respond? Thank you. Yeah, well, it is really important to have a whole continuum of care to make sure that we do have prevention services. So, for example, we will scale up our mental health strategy in schools. We will increase the number of uh, mental health projects that are in school districts. We will increase the number of foundry centres that are available that are non-stigmatising one-stop shop centres that young people can go to. And we will, we will uh, spread these out across the whole of the province. And, you know, it's wrong. It's just wrong to say that work hasn't been started and hasn't been done in all of the different dimensions of area of care that's needed for mental health and substance use. We are working on harm reduction. We are uh, increasing treatment services, for example, increasing access to counselling services and adding those beds that we've talked about as well. And our, our um, approach towards decriminalisation and the safe supply of alternative medicine as well. And so it's really important to recognise that we have started this work. We're trying to build a whole system that is integrated and embedded in the primary care system as well. So if you go to an urgent primary care centre, you will actually be able to access a mental health and addictions professional there. And even in the Burnaby um, emergency room, there's, there's a mental health and substance use zone in there as well. So that this issue is actually embedded across our whole care system. Um, Thank you, Mitzi. Thank you. We'll go to Scott for his response. For, for many people, um, substance use disorder is a chronic and relapsing condition. And uh, I often hear of treatment uh, referred to as, as the only kind of treatment that's there is abstinence-based. And that's absolutely not the current line of thinking right now. Treatment includes a whole spectrum of services, including things like uh, prescription heroin, methadone, suboxone, maintenance programs, uh, and, and other things that, that are part of the treatment process. And so we, we need a full spectrum uh, from basic harm reduction that reaches out to people who are extremely marginalized and not able to access health care and all, all the way up through to a treatment of that's based on evidence and it's there when when people need it i'm i'm a little disturbed uh, to see some bc liberal candidates saying that we need an alberta style approach uh, which is uh, largely now about defunding harm reduction and uh, in increasing the risk of lo loss of life. So that's, that's very concerning to me. Um, I, I think we, now is not the time to turn our back on harm reduction services. It's about creating this full spectrum that meets people where they're at and it's based on evidence and science and the experts and also the expertise of people with lived and living experience telling us what these programs should be looking like. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, our last question of the segment, uh, our last directed question of the segment, I should say, is for uh, Ms. Dean. The pandemic has increased mental health struggles for many British Columbians, as we heard at the outset of this event. Um, and in fact, 87% of British Columbians think most people don't have the mental health supports they need right now. Um, the NDP platform, as you mentioned, focuses on funding more supports in schools and for youth clinics like the Foundry. Um, but what is your party's strategy to make preventative and responsive services for mental health far-reaching and affordable to all BC residents, including those who are undocumented or post-secondary students without extended benefits? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you for the question. I mean, it's really important to make sure that there are no barriers for people who need services. Um, I, I've been working in this sector for over 30 years now, and I actually ran an affordable counselling programme, and it's absolutely vital to uh, make sure that you're able to offer counselling services to people where and when they need them and make sure that there aren't barriers in, in the way that are gonna stop them being able to access services. I've known families uh, that have gone through massive trauma, um, be able to recover and be able to stay together as a family unit because of being able to access services immediately and not have the stress or the worry or the, the prevention for them that they actually have to pay for those services. So we are delivering no cost and low cost counseling programs across the whole of the country um, and and uh, it's it's available through 49 community agencies so we were really reflecting the work that's already going on in communities that understands the needs of communities and making sure that 
uh, services are designed for the needs of, of communities and able to be responsive to them as well. As you mentioned, the Foundry Youth Service, again, the Foundry Youth Service is a, is a great model because it's non-stigmatizing. Youth could be going into a Foundry Centre for any service whatsoever. They don't have a big label on their head that says, I've been abused or I've been traumatised or I've got a mental health issue or I've got an anxiety disorder. And uh, they're able to connect with someone and build that relationship and be able to find the resources that they need and be able to access them how they want to access them and where and how often they want to access them as well. And that really helps with that self-determination for young people finding their own pathway. Um, and also you mentioned the um, mental health in schools, which again, I'm really proud of. We had a wellness center in one of the high schools. Um, well, uh, sorry, the question was about supports not including schools and foundry. So for adults or, or students after graduation. Yeah, and we have um, introduced mental health services on campuses um, through the uh, Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills Training as well. And we've also concentrated on people who have been hardest hit by COVID. So for example, workers affected uh, in the tourism and hospitality sectors, um, making sure that mental health supports are available for them. Um, and for example, suicide prevention program for indigenous youth, um, the post-secondary students, um, uh, support as well and uh, you know we, we really think as soon as uh, we learned about COVID we invested five million dollars uh, to make sure that we increased and scaled thank you, up Jane. our services. Thank, sorry pardon me Missy thank you. Um, we'll go to the response. Uh, Jane do you have a response? Okay so um, I, I, I'd like to, to speak to the, the, the post-secondary because uh, we obviously with and it's and it's and it's worse and exacerbated during COVID. But um, our university students are, are, have stressful lives to begin with, let alone COVID. And the amount of of uh, counseling services that are available in post secondary is woefully inadequate. We need to have these services. I'm actually an advocate of at, you know increasing the age of boundary to 30 or putting them actually uh, in post-secondary uh, institutions because uh, these students need to have access immediately not just because of exams but because of their stresses of of living um, their family life etc and and international students uh, are included in that so i i I, I totally agree with you that we need to step up access to mental health supports for all people um, and, and, and post-secondary students are the ones that I think that um, perhaps have been ignored um, up, up, up to now and that's Thank you. definitely. We'll go to Scott for his response. As, as I mentioned earlier, access to mental health care is, is a, um, extremely concerning and, and one of our top priorities is um, you know largely, largely me mental health is is stigmatized, and so I think many many of the barriers are, are often around where people feel embarrassed to reach out or uh, ashamed or uh, afraid to disclose of things they're struggling with, and so uh, we're we're committed to work uh, to develop public education campaigns uh, removing the stigma uh, around men mental health issues, and so uh, and, as well as funding accesses within communities and in a cultural context that uh, that catch catch people who need some assistance or earlier on and, and so uh, we're, we're committed to dedicating money to that as well as resources and expertise uh, to provide people with the services that that they need and I, I think it's an, it's very important um, a, a lot of uh, indigenous people uh, approach wellness from a very different perspective than white people do I think we need to create supports that integrate uh, existing culture and existing practices uh, in, in a way that, that uh, melds very closely with, with what they're trying to do and their approach to wellness. Thank you, Scott. Um, so that concludes our first segment. We'll now move on to a shorter segment on foundations of wellness. Um, starting with Ms. Thornthwaite, although this is a question I would like each candidate to uh, address um, individually and not respond to her initial response. So, uh, Minister Thwaite, recently there, you apologized for comments you made about NDP MLA Bowen Ma that many said were uh, sexist and racist and ageist. Um, your comments were said in the context of a roast, but in this video you said you had told that particular story before. With that in mind, how have you personally reckoned with your own privilege as a white woman working in mental health spaces where targeted and culturally so safe supports are needed for Black, Indigenous, and people of color of all genders? 
Uh, thank you for the question, and, and I, I have apologized for those comments that were were made. And um, Bowen has uh, graciously accepted those 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 apologies. So we we, we have moved on. Um, but with regards to your question about white privilege, uh, I I totally um, appreciate that, and and I think the premier actually said this uh, last week as well, that uh, a white person cannot totally appre appreciate uh, what people of color um, are experiencing because we haven't had that lived experience. And I think that um, there's been many instances actually during this campaign, not just mine, but uh, with other candidates, that uh, I think that um, getting to the root of uh, educating uh, individuals, all of us, uh, of our maybe unconscious bias that we might have on uh, particular issues is really important to look within. And I've, I've, I've taken that to heart. I, um, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to young people in particular, um, young people of color as well. And uh, they're giving me uh, lessons as to um, where I might have some unconscious bias as, as a, um, a middle-aged white woman. But certainly, I think we all need to do that because we've all got unconscious bias um, somewhere. And I think that uh, conversations, not just at the dinner table, but conversations um, when we're at the coffee shops, etc. cetera. Um, I, 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 I've asked, I've, I've got, my, my assistant is a woman of color and we've had these conversations. And I, I, I must say, I'm getting very, very informed of things that perhaps um, I assumed that I knew or I assumed that I was, um, you know, I, I knew what I was, uh, what somebody else was thinking, but obviously I don't know what they're thinking because I haven't experienced what they've experienced in their life. Thank so you. your question is a good one. Thank you. Thank you for your answer, Jane. I'll go to Scott for your response and, or, and your, your individual response to the question. Yeah, so um, uh, I, I think it's very notable, as you noted, we're, we're all uh, sort of white, white people here on, on a panel and, and mental health uh, mental health uh, and particularly uh, substance use issues disproportionately affect um, people of color, indigenous people. And so I think it's, it's very important uh, for recognizing our, our own privilege in this matter um, and using it. And I know, I know my party has been criticized uh, around diversity. Uh, I, I think it's, it's something that we've acknowledged and are working towards. Uh, having a more diverse slate of candidates. We, we do have five uh, Muslim candidates and we have, have a large slate of uh, women and people of different expertise and experience. Uh, but I, I think we, we have to do better. And I think as, as a, a party, but also as, as a people and individuals, uh, we have to acknowledge our, our position here. And I, and I think, you know, the, the largely my role is where I can to elevate the voices and the experiences of, of people of color. Um, I, I know the, the uh, roots of the war on drugs are uh, based in racism and, uh, and, and in uh, colonization. And I think uh, raising awareness of these issues and um, upending the system to better, better provide supports for people. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. We'll, we'll go to Mitzi for her response. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, being motivated to go into social work and having trained uh, intensely in social work and then later on to be a coach as well, uh, you have to do your own work. You have to know what your privilege is. You have to know what your power is. You have to be very careful and mindful about how that enters into any relationship uh, where you might you have the, the ability to interfere in other people's lives. So um, I have always taken the responsibility and it doesn't mean, you know, the journey is always, always ongoing because you, you've been filtered by your own history and by how everybody treats you and interacts with you every day as well. So um, I take it upon myself to try and educate myself and keep learning. I am so grateful for the support of Elder Shirley Alphonse. She's my mentor and my guide and I can text her and I can visit with her. And, uh, and she has educated me a lot about indigenous communities here. I've always made sure that myself and my teams that I've been responsible for have stepped up into making sure that they have uh, a colonization training and racism training as well. 
and um, and I always seek feedback, but I do not think it's other people's responsibility to teach me. It's my responsibility to learn and to be able to peel away the lens and to understand where my privilege is having an impact in my daily life whenever we're making decisions. Thank you, Mitzi. That's Thank the end of time. Appreciate it. Um, that concludes our second section. So we'll move on to our last segment, which focuses on dignity and human rights in mental health care. Um, and our first question is directed at Ms. Dean, um, noting that it has been almost 25 years since the Mental Health Act came into force in British Columbia. Um, and a meaningful review of the legislation has not only not happened, but it's actually fallen behind the pace of other provinces who have reviewed their own legislation more recently. Um, there's also not a lot of public reporting about how, when, or how often the act is used uh, to detain people in involuntary treatment. Uh, would, if elected again, would you support a public and independent inquiry into the Mental Health Act uh, serving as a review? Uh, and please explain your reasoning. And if not, uh, what are your alternatives to increasing transparency, transparency about the Mental Health Act and how it is used, particularly given that uh, studies have shown it disproportionately impacts Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you for the question. I think as we've all talked about this evening, we're living through two uh, provincial health crises, and every day too many people are dying. And even, even seeing hopefully the curve in the opioid overdeath deaths um, fl hopefully flattening, there were still too many people dying. When we formed government in 2017, even the provincial health officer said there is no system of mental health and addictions care. And so our priority as shown by creating a dedicated ministry has been to try and build that system. And to Forgive the interruption, Mitzi, the question was about the Mental Health Act and how you would either review it or otherwise increase transparency. Could you please answer to that? My priority is making sure that services are available in the community because we have these two crises. What's really important now is to make sure that we're getting the services delivered to the people who need them. That's really important work and that's where we need to have a significant impact. We need to build the system because the system isn't there. So that is, a, that is the priority. Now, of course, we will listen to stakeholders and we want to partner with stakeholders and people with lived experiences as well. And I know that our minister, Judy Darcy, was, was doing that all the time that she was trying to develop her strategy as well and make sure that she identified what the priorities are. But I, I sincerely you know, think at the moment that it's really important to continue building the services and making sure that we're able to reach people who are vulnerable, making sure that we get culturally- Pardon safe. me, in the last 20 seconds of your answer, could you please address the Mental Health Act and whether or not you would look at reviewing it? Well, I agree with your, your question about transparency, that it's really, we're a government that believes in transparency and it's really important to make sure that we create a system of transparency and make sure that there are not additional disadvantages that are being replicated through the use of that act. All right, uh, thank you. We'll go to Jane for your response. Um, thank you very much uh, with regards to the Mental Health Act. And we know that uh, when the NDP introduced Bill 22, uh, which was a revision of the Mental Health Act pertaining to children and youth, uh, as far as um, secure care, uh, that the bill did not actually go past uh, first reading because so many groups and individuals uh, were against it, including the First Nations Leadership Council, the representative for children and youth, uh, the coroner, and uh, justice groups. And I think that um, it was very poorly timed because we've, I now know that uh, the representative is in the process of reviewing the Mental Health Act. And I was very disappointed to learn this, that the NDP had not uh, bothered to discuss this uh, with the representative for children and youth. So I absolutely do support um, a review of the Mental Health Act. The Ombudsman has made some very significant uh, points about what is wrong with it and uh, needs to be updated. And um, absolutely, it uh, would be something that I would have a priority in advocating for. Thank you, Jane. To Scott? Yes, absolutely. We would support an independent review of the Mental Health Act. Uh, um, our Mental Health Act is uh, antiquated. Uh, it's um, violating of constitutional charter rights, and it's also uh, in violation of the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And, and largely the problems with the Mental Health Act are issues around uh, deemed consent, 
where uh, pe people are uh, deemed to have consented to involuntary treatment and confinement. And these were, these were critiques, as Jane brought up, uh, they, these have been uh, brought up by the provincial ombudsman, as well as nonprofit groups who uh, criticize the Mental Health Act uh, for, um, for these, these violations of human rights, but also uh, its lack of transparency of how it's used and how uh, a legal representation of, of whether people are able to get legal counsel and support when their rights are being taken away. And so um, we, we are the only province, our, our, our uh, Mental Health Act stands out from the rest of Canada and having um, things like no provisions for substitute decision making and uh, involuntary treatment with deemed consent. And we need to, um, we need to really look at this and, um, and have an independent, impartial review of the Mental Health Act and work towards creating one that's not antiquated. Thank you, Scott. Um, and the next, uh, we'll move on to the next question, which is directed at Ms. Lauren Thwaite. Um, as you just mentioned, your party was critical of Bill 22, which would have allowed further uh, detention of youth who overdose for up to seven days. Um, experts have been critical of expanding involuntary care in general, uh, simply because they believe it doesn't address the root causes of uh, mental illness and, and, uh, and needs for treatment. But in the BC Liberal platform, uh, you want to introduce a Safe Care Act to funnel more youth into involuntary treatment. Why this bill when you were so critical of the NDP's Bill 22 and expanding youth detention? So the difference between the Safe Care Act and Bill 22 is a matter of degree. Uh, the, the Bill 22, there was 48 hours of, of um, so-called secure care uh, for children and youth. And the problem with that and, and, and all of the problems that we've seen in secure care uh, in, in other jurisdictions, and I know um, Alberta is in the process of reviewing their entire act as well as, as secure care. Um, the problem is, is if you discharge somebody, and the coroner has said this, um, without the proper supports, without the proper follow-ups, and in this case, it was 48 hours, um, then it actually increases the chance of that individual, in this case, a child, uh, having an overdose because the tolerance is so far down. So what we're advocating for is longer term. And all the discussions that I have talked with uh, mothers, mostly mothers, but also mothers and fathers of children who have died of overdoses are in support of a longer term uh, continuum of care, not 48 hours, but a longer term. Uh, I asked- Could you elaborate asked, on the accountability mechanisms uh, that would be in place for a longer yeah. care? So, so what the, specifically we're talking about youth, okay? And and what I had asked and begged the NDP government to do numerous times when I had introduced it is please just bring this act to the legislation or to the legislature so we can have this debate. We can we can debate back and forth, you know, the length and what the the, the care is while the, while the person is 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 in secure care. We can debate all of that. But the fact is, is that we need to do something because what's happening right now is children are dying. Children are arriving in, a, in an emergency ward, getting discharged within sometimes hours, let alone a day, and they immediately go out and are at high risk of overdoses. And that's what's happened to a lot of the children of parents that I've talked to Thank that you, support Jane. secure care. Thank you. We'll go to Mr. Bernstein for his response. I, I'm very sympathetic to parents uh, that have uh, children who struggle with uh, substance use issues and, and often it's, you know, as a parent myself, it's, I can imagine it's very difficult to watch your son or daughter um, be, be in this situation. However, uh, involuntary confinement and treatment is not the answer. There's no evidence to support that this is a, a path, whether it's through Bill 22 or uh, Secure Care, Safe Care. Um, and our, our party notably uh, did not support Bill 22. Um, and that was after listening to uh, our own BC coroner uh, describe the bill as so poorly drafted as to risk increasing death rather than preventing it. And also the, uh, the very, um, the very firm opposition to this of uh, First Nations who saw rightfully that the people most affected 
the young people most affected by this legislation would be indigenous youth and the idea of, of taking them away from their situation and forcibly confining them uh, seemed uh, seemed quite uh, disturbing as it does did to us so we thank you Scott <laughs> that's your time I uh, will go to Mitzi for her response yeah, thank you. Yeah, what a torment it must be for parents um, who are living through these kinds of situations. And I know a lot of parents came and spoke to the minister over her time when she was Minister of Mental Health and Addictions and uh, had a significant impact. And of course, she was also talking to the pilot program at uh, BC Children's Hospital as well, um, and talking with many other stakeholders as well. And I know from my past experience of working on youth committees, it's a complex issue. Um, and so we have, we, in terms of Bill 22, it has been paused uh, in order for there to be more consultation, for there to be more stakeholders to get involved and to have that discussion that needs to include families, youth, indigenous communities, indigenous youth, uh, and all of those uh, key stakeholders. And of course, we need to build the whole continuum of care, as we've said before, because we need to make sure that those acute services are, are readily available when they're needed, and that there's that continuum of care once we're able to move youth into the community or uh, support for, for families in the community as well. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, our last question, our last structured question of the evening, um, or uh, directed question, pardon me, goes to Mr. Bernstein. Um, a number of Canadians recently and historically, um, a large and disproportionate amount of whom are Indigenous, Black and people of colour, are killed or seriously injured by police during what are called wellness checks. And the Green Platform specifically mentions reviewing this process. What actions would your government take to eliminate or decrease the role of police in mental health response in BC? And would you support defunding police to redirect resources to community mental health responses? Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a very, um, very complex question, but I'll, I'll tackle it. So uh, de defunding the police, largely when we talk about things like decriminalization of uh, substance use or, or other issues, we're, we're talking about uh, lowering the police presence which would, uh, in a sense, reduce their budget. And so that gives us a lot of opportunity to invest in other areas. And so uh, our party is proposing um, reviewing uh, the system of wellness checks. We think it should be non-police responders who are built up in the communities to respond. So uh, for, for example, things like integrated mental health and crisis teams that would go in and respond in these situations and, and not the police. Like I, I don't, I just don't think that the police are particularly well trained or effective in dealing with a lot of these issues of mental health or um, substance use. And uh, as the point of them being the first responder, it also creates conflict and in, in some cases, unnecessary uh, death uh, for, for people. And, and again, this is targeted at uh, pe people of color and indigenous people. And so I think creating a system where the police are not the first responders, but we have an integrated system of, of wellness checks and, and support team involving mental health experts is, is the way we should be doing this. And that's what we support. Thank you, Scott. Uh, we'll go to Jane for her response and then Mitzi. Well, unfortunately, uh, because of this snap election that was just called by the NDP, the review of the Police Act uh, that was uh, started has now been squashed. Uh, that would have been a good opportunity to have these discussions. Uh, what I worry about is uh, what is the definition of defund police? Um, I think that within police departments, there are, there are mental health uh, specialists and if, if, if there was going to be a funding cut those would be the ones that would first probably lose their jobs. I am a huge advocate of the CAR 40 type program or the ability for psychiatric nurses or social workers uh, to attend with police on, um, on mental health calls. Uh, there's, there's models out there that um, Pathways Serious uh, Mental Illness has, has projected that, the, that they, the police come in, in plain clothes, not uh, with, um, in uniform, and that there's partnerships with uh, mental health specialists with them to try to de-escalate uh, the, the confrontation and get these people help. There's also models that um, it is the, the healthcare professional, the mental health professional that actually takes the individual away from the situation to either 
uh, a hospital to get assessed or some some other um, body to, to to offer those success. So we definitely need to uh, bump up our services with mental health Thank uh, supports. You. Thank you. That's your time. And uh, we'll go to Mitzi for the final response. Thank you. Yeah, well, I was dismayed uh, during the early years of my work here in British Columbia when I was running a community social service agency to experience the cutbacks that were made in ser support services and community services made by the BC Liberals, because I exactly saw what that translated into in my community. And that was that people with mental health issues that were vulnerable and that were out in the community and that were at risk were exactly getting picked up by RCMP and bylaws officers. And that was ending up criminalizing them and not getting them to the supports and the services that they needed. So, you know, what we need is an increase in supports and services and building on these models where that if needed, there are partnership models with the police. But if we're able to, and this is what we've been doing, increase all of the supports and services that people can access them where and when they need them, then there's much less of likelihood that they're going to come to the attention of the police or uh, as a first response, and they're going to be able to get onto their own pathway to recovery. Um, and we're, we have committed to increasing services directly targeted at Indigenous communities and at racialized communities, recognizing there are increased barriers and increased levels of mental health issues in communities that are disadvantaged. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and since we have a little bit of extra time, I'd like to bring us back to one roundup question. You'll each have uh, one minute to respond um, in random order. But uh, during the leaders debate, and this is a point that uh, was made earlier on, I believe in the first segment of this evening, um, during the leaders debate last week, Andrew Wilkinson asked what John Horgan was doing to treat the causes and to stop the harms that lead to homelessness uh, that is further complicated by mental health and addictions. Um, and he is, and Andrew Wilkinson has also criticized the NDP for warehousing people with complex mental health and substance use challenges. Not speaking necessarily about the treatment or the uh, intervention side of things, what policy solutions would your party propose to end systemic and structural root causes that lead to mental health and substance use challenges, such as childhood trauma and abuse? Uh, we will go first to Jane. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think um, obviously I had, I've spoken before about prevention, getting to these getting to the kids uh, early on in the schools, um, and and offering support, counseling support uh, for these kids um, in in whatever um, capacity. Certainly, anxiety, depression, and and other um, other problems that kids are coming up with need to get immediate um, immediate help. Um, with regards to what um, you, you mentioned about the, the debate, I think the issue is also that um, we, we, we can't be um, putting people in places without the proper supports. We are advocates, the BC Liberals are advocating for 24 hour support, wraparound supports, so that the people don't spill out into the community. And that's when um, the, the, the problems arise. And as we're seeing it in many, many cities, uh, in, in, including Vancouver right now, and there was just a woman that was beaten by a, a with a pipe um, from Strathcona Park around the Strathcona Park uh, tent cities, and 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 we can't have um, this this um, this violence uh, occurring in in communities uh, because the people that need need the support, the vulnerable people. Uh, either homeless or have, have have mental illness or addictions, uh, they're not getting the support they need. So, so thank you, Jane. Um, That's time. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, we'll go to Mitzi and then Scott. Yeah, well, it's a it's a really good question. And again, unfortunately, in my time uh, working in community, I saw many many significant cutbacks. And as I said, that led to really long wait times for kids who needed services, um, and also less. Um, supports going into families to be able to help them provide that nurturing environment that everybody wants to provide to their children. I'm very proud to say that the NDP government made sure that we were tackling all the determinants of mental health and substance use. Uh, for example, in the Ministry of Children and Family Development, increasing the delegation of responsibility for Indigenous children in care, making sure that they were able to be served within their communities. 
um, but rolling out a strategy for poverty reduction, making sure that we lift children and families out of poverty, supporting increases in tackling gender-based violence that we know have a disadvantageous uh, impact on mental health and well-being of children and youth in their families as well, for example. Significant investments in healthcare, um, as well as um, making sure that we invest in connectivity so that people have ways of reducing their isolation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mitzi and to Scott. Homelessness, substance disorder, mental health issues are, are often symptoms of, uh, of much larger systemic problems. And so we, we need to tackle these through the social determinants of health. And so we, we need to put housing first and make sure everybody in the province has safe and affordable housing. Uh, and, and we're uh, going to invest in, committed to invest in that. We need to make sure that everyone has income security. And so they need, we need a basic income level that allows people to provide for themselves and, um, and, and live, live in our expensive province. Uh, and then we also need food security. And so I think those, those three things are, are largely um, uh, part, part of the roots of the problems. And we're, we're not going to address this problem just nibbling around the edges and creating uh, stopgap measures. We, we really need to look as a society about building a sustainable and equitable future for everybody in it. And it starts with providing people with housing, with income, and with food. And those are, those are three things that, that really are, uh, need to be integrated to further and support the mental health of everyone in, in this province. Thank you. Um, and we have time for one more uh, free form questions. Or, uh, so we will answer this one in reverse order. Scott, then Mitzi, then Jane. Um, and the question is, um, you know, the BCNDP recently have laid the beginnings for a foundation of supportive housing. Um, but long-term mental health and addiction supports are missing across the board, particularly with people who live with both physical or intellectual or both uh, disabilities. The green platform outlines a housing first strategy for people with complex housing needs. How will each party make these supports available to people in supportive housing through a disability lens? We'll go to Scott. It's to you, Scott. Sorry, thanks. I was having you. So um, I, I think look, looking at uh, the situation in con context of, of people's needs and the particular ones is best done by, by asking them. I think including people who have lived or living experience of, of the intersectional issue you're trying to address is, is the way that we design programs that work best. And so I think the, the, be the best way to design housing that supports people with disabilities is to uh, work with them in, in a very collaborative and very um, engaging way that, that allows them to design systems for that. And I think ultimately trusting, trusting evidence and the expertise of those people. So our, our party is like really on, on our entire platform is, is really about evidence-based uh, experts uh -huh. for, for problems. And so that includes uh, the housing and includes uh, addressing specific issues about, about like how, how we provide, how we have challenges to provide housing for people with disabilities and for other uh, issues that require uh, different treatment. Thank you. And now we will go to Mitzi for her response. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, just a year or so ago, I was really excited to be opening a new affordable housing um, complex. And within that, uh, many of the units were actually designed for people who are dependent upon wheelchairs. And of course, the physical space has to be designed for that reason. And, and the mum and a daughter were there um, going and having a look around and they were shouting at each other from the different bathrooms and, and just being so excited about being able to move in and have it immediately so functional. And, it, and really so dignified for them as well. So I'm really proud of our housing, uh, our housing plan that we're rolling out over 10 years to make sure that we tackle the terrible housing crisis that accumulated over 16 years under the previous government. And we're making sure that um, all of the housing proposals and projects do bring a gender-based analysis plus lens. And so that means that we have to look at the design and, um, and the needs in the community through, through lenses that of intersectionality that obviously include disability as well. And of course, we need to make sure that we are working with the disability community uh, and, and all of those stakeholders as we move forward with our, our next steps in that plan. Thank you. And Jane, for your last response. 
uh, the BC Liberal platform has a, a portion in there with regards to housing and uh, renovations uh, that are uh, for those with disabilities and also to include in the building code that there is, is adequate, uh, particularly in rental housing um, facilities uh, for, for those with disabilities. Um, but but uh, with regards to the housing first question or the supportive housing question, we absolutely need to have wraparound supports. Housing first, I'm absolutely as supportive of that, but it can't just be housing. It has to be wraparound supports to help people and, and uh, with, with, with their mental health or, or addictions or whatever issue that they have that, that, that needs help. So uh, that would be something that I would want to just qualify that uh, we support the housing first initiative, but there has to be supports along with it. Understood. All right, thank you all. That concludes the structured portion of our debate. Um, however, we are, we are going to move into the Q&A portion for the next 20 minutes. Um, and while there are a lot of questions, so we'll try to get through as many as possible, I will indicate um, who to whom the question is addressed or if it is addressed to all candidates. Um, and we'll, uh, if you could please try to keep your speaking time to between 45 seconds and one minute, would be grateful. Um, our first question is about uh, there's a lot on youth and homelessness that's coming in. Um, and this question is first from um, the fact, uh, from someone who's concerned about international students in British Columbia. And BC has a very large population of international students um, who this person says are more likely to face challenges with depression and anxiety, adjusting to new cultures and integrating into new ways of life. At the same time, they may feel uninformed or reluctant to access services. How would you increase their access, either through post-secondary or elsewhere? And as the numbers, uh, as their numbers may be significant, how would you fund this increased access? We'll go first to Mitzi, then to Jane, and then to Scott. Yeah, thank you for that. There has been a significant trend of increasing international students uh, coming to British Columbia. I'm very proud to say that our Ministry of Advanced Education Skills and Training has uh, created a program of mental health supports. Um, for uh, for students, and that's a that's a significant new program um, that is a, that's available. Um, we've also invested in making sure that many of our grants for community ser service counselling are available in different languages as well, and uh, made sure that they're delivered by agencies that work within immigrant and uh, refugee communities as well. So hopefully. Um, there would be an ability to access some services there um, and uh, you know, understand that it's a, it's a challenging time for an international student. We need to make sure that we get all of that information available to them through all of the systems that we can so that they can access those services and preserve their health and make the best of being in our beautiful province. Thank you, Mitzi. We'll now go to Jane. This is a very timely topic. Um, I was uh, part of a group called The Good Pitch that um, gets together uh, people, ex experts in certain levels of fields. Uh, certainly I wasn't the expert, but uh, because of my involvement with the film industry, I was asked to be part of it. There's an excellent film called The World is Bright. And what that is about is specifically what you're talking about is an international student that came into Vancouver and was not getting the help that they needed with their mental illness and uh, there was, I'm not going to give away the movie, but the, the, the point is, is, is that the, the culture where that student came from was a, um, a culture that perhaps mental illness wasn't accepted. And so this, this student was less likely to seek help because uh, where he came from, there was no help and perhaps it was um, brought shame uh, to the family. So I, I, I absolutely agree that we need to bump up supports with post-secondary with a specific interest in um, international students who have left their home, probably feel isolated. There could be language difficulties. So we definitely need to step up support for our post-secondary students and international students. Thank you, Jane, and to Scott. I, I myself was an international student when I came to UBC in 2006. Uh, I didn't have language barriers. I had some cultural and isolation barriers too. And I can imagine uh, for many others though, it's, it's quite, uh, quite more significant. And so we're, we're committed to, uh, with, with our funding of 
mental health access through the MSP, everyone would be available to, or, or would have um, the ability to access mental health care. And I think, and also with our uh, provincial wide education program, we, we, we could develop specific programs targeted at post secondary students, uh, all with a cultural lens. And so I think having, having students themselves uh, design programs and messaging. Uh, in, in coordination with the government about how, how to reach out to people and their their peers is um, uh, is is one way that we can ensure that that we we address some of those issues that like Jane was referring to like the stigma uh, that's a cultural stigma of of uh, reaching out and asking for help like I think I think a lot of times uh, approaching people who are in the community to ask for their help and how do we how do we reach young people in your community uh, could, could be a helpful way to design a program for that. Thank you. Our next question is about uh, supports for parents who may have access, whose children and, and youth in their care may have um, uh, been committed to, may have been um, involuntarily uh, detained for treatment or, um, or otherwise are feeling that they're out of um, options for how to help, help their, their child or their, um, the person they have guardianship over. Um, how will your party support parents who are trying to help their children with mental health and substance use? Um, and how will you support caregivers after, um, during community-based or, or, or outpatient care um, after these youth have been detained? We'll go first to Mitzi and then to Scott and then to Jane. Well, thank you. I think this is part of our continuum of care. I mean, you know, I've worked with so many families where this is the this is one of the core issues that the parents don't get any support, um, and yet they see their kids uh, are suffering and are you know harming themselves um, or um, unable to regain that mental well-being and, and that health for themselves, um, and it's painful for parents. And the model of work that I had always delivered was integrated and collaborative. Um, and working with the whole family holistically and making sure that everybody was clear about what their roles and responsibilities were. The models that our um, team and our programs are rolling out are, are based on good practice and evidence-based practice that creates the best results and the best outcomes for children and youth. And so that means engaging with the family and making sure that everybody's rights are respected and that people get the support that they need in a way that moves forward so that those young people get the best care at all different stages of the continuum of, of the care that they're, they're needing. Thank you. We'll go to Scott. I, I think the answer uh, to this around uh, our commitment to build strong uh, community supports uh, around mental health. And I think, I think part, part of uh, what we can do is develop programs uh, that, that address from a local level rather than so, something that's, that's done in a, a big top-down fashion. And, and I think individuals, in, in individual families, their needs will be different, their situation will be different, uh, but, but re reaching out at an early stage uh, providing supports for families before uh, issues become too problematic. And then if they aren't situations where, where young people are, are confined or uh, having issues, we, we need to create a flexible and responsive system to, to offer them this, whatever supports they need, whether that's whether that's uh, counseling themselves, whether it's income support, whether it's um, uh, support within the workplace, those, those kinds of things to help the family uh, be resilient and strong and, um, and, and weather that. Thank you. And Jane? I, th I think um, this all comes down to mental health literacy as well. I, I remember um, talking with Dr. Stan Kusher, who's now actually a senator, uh, with regards to educating kids early on in life, um, obviously in the school system, as well as the parents, on mental health literacy to know that uh, when is the time that they should be seeking help, how is how they're feeling affecting their relationships or their ability to, to, to finish assignments, et cetera. Um, there's, there, there's ways to, um, to, to, to teach children that now is the time for them to seek help and that the stigma is that uh, it's okay to seek help because, uh, um, 
everybody's doing it, sort of, so to speak. That it's 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 normalized that you would seek help with a mental health specialist, like just like you would with your doctor if you had a sore stomach or something like that. So these are the types of things that kids need to know right away um, as they're growing up, so that they know when to seek help. And parents need to be part of that as well, and they also need to be educated as to where the help is, because I think this is where some some things fall apart is, is that the parents have realized that, uh oh, there's something wrong with my child and I need that, that child to get some help and they don't know where to access that help. Thank you. So we, That's time, Jane. Thank you. Uh, our next question uh, moves a little bit into um, the pandemic side of things, which obviously overarches our, uh, our debate here tonight. Um, in the, but in the context of an economic recession like the one we're in, working age adults have a very high and elevated risk of uh, dying by suicide. And research shows that supportive government economic policy can directly reduce the risk of dying by suicide. Um, how will you incorporate mental health support into BC's economic recovery? And what economic supports do you propose specifically for working adults? Uh, we will go to Jane and then to Scott and then to Mitzi. Well, I, I really appreciated your uh, paper that you sent us focusing on economic recovery without prioritizing mental health could mean devastating, devastating long term consequences. We know that this pandemic and I think it was Johnny that mentioned it at, at the opening remarks has negatively influenced people's mental health. Um, people are, are afraid. Some of them are unemployed. Uh, kids are worried about going back to school. Parents are worried. There's all of these 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 issues that are pandemic related, but it's also reflective of, of any mental illness that was already there is exacerbated. And that's where you're getting it, saying that there's increased um, levels of suicide or suicide uh, ideation. Again, I think that um, we need to bump up these supports. I, I agree with your, your, your recommendations as far as cross-sectoral provincial leadership. It's not just um, one size fits all. It's not just one ministry. We've got ministers of health, MCFD, education, and community workers, uh, including the Canadian Mental Health Association and all of the services that they provide. We need to have a, a complete system of care that, that goes to all of these um, experts that, that are out there in, in the community that are helping people, but it can't just be from Thank one talk. Thank Sorry. you. Scott. Thank you. Yeah, so, so COVID has really kicked us in the ass in, in many ways, uh, as we've all experienced. And, and um, you know, we, we need a very bold and progressive action to have an economic recovery. Uh, and, and, and again, I, you know, people's mental health is affected by how well they're doing, by their job, by their income. Uh, the, these are all uh, interrelated things. And so the best things we can do are support families by uh, providing things like child care, uh, free, free child care by providing income security, by providing, uh, um, by, by working with business places to provide f flexible working arrangements that allow people to take the time when they need it uh, and work when they can. Uh, you know, we, we, we've all been working remotely now. I think uh, there's, there's no excuse for businesses to uh, require us all to show up uh, uh, five days a week uh, for eight hours a day necessarily in, in work. So I think we, we have a lot of opportunities to create a, a new vision of a, a sustainable and healthy environment that supports uh, building a green economy and supports families uh, to get back on their feet, feet again. Thank you, Mitzi. Thank you. Yeah, this has had a really significant impact um, on all British Columbians. And it's not a fair and it's not a just pandemic. It has a discriminating impact and it, it adds to disadvantages and barriers that people are already experiencing. So it's increasing the gap between people who have and who have security and health and safety and people who don't. It's been really important to support people to be able to return to work because that impacts people's mental health and it impacts their long-term security and to have a return to school. We rolled out a system of, of wage supplements and, and benefits to be able to create that safety and security for people. We introduced protections around rent because again, being the risk of being evicted was uh, impacting people's mental health um, and um, uh, 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 mental health and wellness. 
Um, we applied a gender-based analysis plus lens to the impact of the pandemic and to our recovery. So that means we looked at that intersectionality to have a look at who's been most disadvantaged and of our programs of the economic stimulus program and of our response to the pandemic programs, we made sure that we were trying to close the gap and pick up and not leave behind the most vulnerable. And we were fortunate to have a diverse economy and already be investing strongly in infrastructure that will support Thank our you. recovery. Thank you. Um, our next question uh, is a little bit into the numbers, so I'll, I'll ask uh, for short and sweet answers uh, of under 30 seconds. But um, the CMHA is calling for about $2 billion to be invested by the next government into mental health and substance use supports and services. Um, is there a number in mind that uh, you would like, that you are committing to uh, investing um, to set uh, BC on the right course that we, uh, or, or a course that you, that you find acceptable. We'll go to Jane, to Mitzi, and then to Scott. So your recommendation was to increase funding, uh, as I'm looking here, for a four-year uh, investment across health authorities. Um, and I appreciated your um, mention of children and youth mental health services. So I, I agree that we need to bump it up. I do not have at the top of my head a number on each of those um, sectors, but obviously we need prevention, harm reduction, treatment, recovery, and also enforcement as part of a, a, a total continuum of care for uh, individuals that are suffering from mental health and addictions. Thank you, Jane. We'll go to, uh, to Mitzi. Thank you. Well, we already invest $2.5 billion a year into mental health and substance use services and programs. Uh, we had been increasing that year on year since we formed government in 2017. Uh, as I said, we invested $332 million immediately into the opioid crisis. In our platform, I think we put a figure of $480 million in there. In the BC Liberals platform, the figure is uh, $15 million, I believe. Um, and I do want to highlight that we're also investing in tackling the determinants of mental, mental health and substance use issues. So across ministries, investing in housing, investing in poverty reduction, investing in healthcare, investing in connectivity, making sure that we're giving prioritization within programming as well to pick up the most vulnerable people who, have been, who are the most impacted as well. Thank you. Thank you. And to Scott? Yeah, we, we've committed to invest an additional $10 billion into uh, the COVID recovery and economic plan, which would include um, uh, an inclusive and green recovery from COVID. And so, uh, as I talked about previously, one billion of that specifically is, is going towards uh, additional mental health support. Um, I, I don't have specific breakdown of number on, on uh, other issues uh, that, that we're adding to, but it's largely uh, focusing on, on things that are the social determinants of health. And so it's things that have, uh, including housing, income, uh, income security, food security. Um, and, and so that which, which we've already talked about <coughs> things being related to uh, mental, mental health as well. Thank you all. Uh, the next question uh, is also directed to everyone. Um, amid, like the, the, uh, there was a recent report from BC Office of the Human Rights Commissioner that recommended a legislative framework uh, with which the government could move ahead in collecting disaggregated um, race, gender, and, and otherwise disaggregated data um, on health on a number of government programs in BC in order to make policy more equitable and relevant to specific communities. Does your party support uh, this collection and would you support it expanding um, into uh, understanding better the way that the overdose crisis affects different communities? We will go to Scott and then to Mitzi and then to Jane. Uh, yes, absolutely. That sounds like a wonderful idea. I think we really need to look at uh, the disparities among different people who live in BC and how our policies affect them. And so I think we, we have a, we, we have a, a, a special commitment to indigenous peoples based on our relationship as, as a colonial uh, settler on, in the, and the in historic injustices, but we have a very diverse province and we have a lot of uh, different, uh, different cultural uh, impacts and perspectives. And so we need to be looking at uh, all, that, all that data as, as much as we can and basing our policies on, on evidence of what we learn. Thank you, Timitzi. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, we've received the report and committed to working with the Human Rights Commissioner on finding a way forward. Um, it's really important. I found this in my role as Parliamentary Secretary for Gender Equity. It's really important to have accurate data to be able to identify uh, where people are disadvantaged, where people are underrepresented, where there are barriers to people accessing government services, for example. Um, and I, I know this work has been going on for a long time. I've um, sat on the Multiculturalism Committee and talked to lots of different groups in the community. And so it is complex work. We have to listen to all the communities and listen to their concerns about gathering data, about who owns the data, how the data get used and make sure that it is all done respectfully and safely and securely because we know that there are disadvantaged groups in British Columbia already. We don't want to create another system that actually increases that disadvantage or increases risks to anybody as well. But we're, it's difficult for us to apply a gender-based analysis plus lens if we don't have all of the information to actually know who does this, this particular program benefit? Who does it serve? Who's, who's it aimed at? Uh, where should we be seeing outcomes? And ultimately, how are we going to close those gaps that exist across our province between different groups where there's privilege and advantage and compared to um, where there's disadvantage and experience of barriers? Thank you, Mitzi. Jane? Uh, yes, I do agree with uh, what the other speakers have said, that um, we need better data. And uh, we, the only way that we can make ev evidence-based decisions is to have better data. And that's to be able to get the data and find out where uh, the supports are lacking with specific groups, and then ensure that we target our supports to those groups that need it most. So I'm absolutely an advocate of, of, of getting the data, obviously, in a respectful way and safe and, and, and privacy way. Thank you all. Uh, we have time for, I think, one more question. Um, this question is from Ingrid Mendez de Cruz, who spoke to us at the beginning of tonight's event. Um, how will your party respond to the mental health and substance use needs of underserved, often even unseen, yet severely impacted communities such as migrant workers, and those with precarious immigration or refugee status. Um, we know from, from reporting that this group has been growing during COVID due to uh, immigration delays uh, induced by the pandemic. So how will your party remain accountable to ensure these communities can access resources and funding without risking uh, their immigration status? We will go uh, to Mitzi, to Scott, and then to Jane. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for the question. And uh, again, Ingrid, thank you so much for all of your work and for your advocacy as well. We know there are many uh, great groups in British Columbia who support immigrant workers um, and support underserved and, and underrepresented groups in the province. And many of my colleagues uh, have been able to connect me with uh, groups around the province because, uh, you know, knowing and understanding their communities, they know who are the agencies who represent them and connect with them as well. And so it's working with communities and being able to hear from those community groups through uh, the, the community serving agencies or however they're able to find their voice. Um, we, would, we would want to be able to make sure that we listen to those voices in planning our programs. And we've actually been investing in these areas because we have made sure that at least a third of our grants for mental health supports in communities are going to uh, communities where there are known to be disadvantages, whether it's based on race or immigration status, refugee status, um, indigenous identity. So we have been at the LGBTQ2S plus community, for example. So we've been making sure that we're targeting funding to uh, be able to address those deficiencies. Thank you, Mitzi, uh, and to Scott. Uh, I, I agree with Mitzi. We, we need to do this as a bottom-up approach by working with the existing community-based organizations who are already working with these uh, populations and, and, and really use them as the experts about how to best address the problems. And so I think we could, you know, we, we need to think about ways to support them programmatically as well as financially. And that could be through uh, grant grants or through other types of uh, things to support uh, communities who are working with uh, particularly marginalized um, community organizations working with particularly marginalized communities uh, like immigrant communities as you mentioned but uh, definitely we should be uh, we, sh we should be um, paying attention to that and, and working on that. Thank you Scott. Jane? 
Yeah, I'm, I, I don't really have that much more to add to the other speakers, but um, just to thank Ingrid very much for her work and her dedication and uh, that governments need to uh, listen and learn from the groups that you rep that that uh, you represent and uh, step up uh, supports and uh, certainly if if i'm re-elected um, i would be very happy to come and visit you and uh, see what you're doing and and um, obviously advocate for your work and see uh, what i can do to help you Thank you all. Uh, that concludes our Q&A portion. I apologize to anyone whose question uh, you did not get to ask. We had a lot in the queue. We had over 30 questions and about two dozen submitted before the event. Um, so with that in mind, please do contact your, your candidates or their, their parties if you have further questions. Um, we will now move into closing statements and the order will be in the reverse of the random order we drew for opening statements. So we'll start with Scott and then go to Jane and then finish with Mitzi. So Scott, you have two minutes starting now. Yeah, thank you. And again, I just want to thank um, uh, Moira and, and uh, Mitzi and Jane and the organizers of this great, uh, great panel. It's, it's such an, and, and, and to you who are watching, watching and listening and asking questions. Um, it's, it's such an important issue. Um, it, it's very near and dear to my heart how we respond to the overdose crisis, and uh, we, we can do better. And, and I, I think we, we have the tools and we have the knowledge and the expertise to do better. And, and there's no reason we should be having um, uh, 127 people die this month. And in previous months, it's been uh, setting records in BC. It's, it's a public health crisis uh, that, that hasn't been addressed as urgently as it could be by this government. And, and so I think it's important to raise awareness of these issues, but also put in place evidence-based programs at a scale where they're gonna make a difference. And so um, I, I think it's, it's a time for bold action. Uh, the BC Greens have a, a bold and uh, progressive way to take us into the future in all aspects through uh, other pressing issues of climate change, of uh, income security and social supports, uh, as well as mental health and response to the overdose crisis. I, I think I think we need to be thinking about um, new new solutions. For example, um, the use of uh, psychedelic therapies for treating uh, depression and post traumatic stress uh, stress disorder. These are all in uh, trials now, in various stages. We should be committed to uh, getting these online to help people. We, we need to be thinking about the systemic problems with legislation, like the Mental Health Act. And we need to be uh, thinking really carefully about things like Bill 22, about what it actually means to involuntarily confine a young person and to put um, barriers to them reaching out for help because of that. And, and these, are, these are all uh, approaches that we need to be taking from a lens of human rights, social inclusion, and public health. And uh, if I'm elected, I'm gonna advocate uh, for these policies as uh, strong as I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. To Jane. Uh, yes, thank you again. And thank you all to the organizers and obviously uh, the moderator as well, as well as the speakers before. As I mentioned, uh, the BC Liberals are supportive of all the four pillars, uh, prevention, harm reduction, treatment, recovery, as well as enforcement. But I'd like to focus a little bit on the treatment and the recovery. And uh, um, oh, it was mentioned earlier that um, for whatever reason, people think that we don't support harm reduction. That is absolutely not true. In fact, it was uh, Dr. Terry Lake, who was our health minister way back in 2016, who introduced the public health emergency for the overdose crisis, in addition to providing uh, many, many harm reduction supports. What we're saying is, is that we need to do more. Harm reduction isn't enough. We need to get people in the, into treatment and recovery options. We need to step up the funding for the ability for people to get access to immediate treatment when they need it, and also a continuum of care so that they're not falling through the cracks. And that's how we're going to help people get well. So we have um, put, put on our platform, you can see it, increase addiction treatment and recovery programs, increase mental health supports in public secondary schools with psychiatric nurses, and what we want to do also is teach or is, is treat abstinence-based programs equally. And in the platform, ending the funding discrimination. Uh, Brenda mentioned earlier that 
their, their success rate is 90% success rate for three and a half years treat, of treatment through their, their programs. That's pretty amazing. So we should be looking, when we're talking about evidence, we should be looking at the evidence that recovery actually does work. There are many, many people out there that are in recovery and living successful lives back with their families, being contributing members to society. We've got to give them um, credence in our society so that we recognize that recovery works and, and help them and help others uh, develop their own recovery regime and through a pathway to care so that they uh, can become well and, and um, be contributing members of society. Thank you, Jane, that's your time. Uh, Mitzi, we'll go to you for your last uh, two minutes. Well, thank you. Thank you to everyone involved in making this evening happen. Really appreciate it because every time we can have public discussion, we can work to reduce stigma. We still have a long way to go in order to build a system of care for mental health and addictions that gives people the support that they need and deserve. Thank you to everyone who is part of our mental health system. We will continue to work in partnership with you. For 16 years, the BC Liberals focused on working for those at the top. We experienced cuts and neglect to the mental health services that people needed. And it meant cuts and neglects like freezing income assistance rates for a decade that made life for already vulnerable people even more difficult. And all of this adds up to the problems that we're facing today. In just over three years, our government has made significant progress. But not only is there much more left to do, the COVID-19 pandemic has presented new challenges. John Horgan and the BC NDP are committed to putting people and their health first. A BC NDP government will continue to build a whole system of care to address mental health and substance use issues. We will continue to demonstrate leadership, meet commitments and make investments, follow evidence-based models of practice and build equity into our pathway to hope. By voting for the BC NDP, we can build the mental health and addiction system of care that people need and deserve, as well as provide the services and supports to help keep people safe, healthy, and secure. Thank you. Thank you very much all. Um, I really appreciated this lively and, and informative debate tonight. Um, and I am sure our audience did as well. I will now turn things over to uh, our CEO of the CMHA in BC, Johnny Morris, for closing comments. Well, thank you so much, Moira, and um, what a well-moderated debate. Thank you very much indeed, Moira. Um, just in closing this evening, um, I want to thank each of the candidates, uh, Mitzi, Scott, Jane, for um, stepping into such an important discourse and discussion this evening. Um, it takes courage to run for public office, and the mental health of those seeking office and those who are elected is, of course, of equal concern to us too at the CMHA. And so I just want to um, signal strong appreciation for the time it took to prepare for this evening um, and the ways in which you engage with each other and the questions posed. Um, thank you very much indeed for, for bringing forth um, such, um, such thoughtfulness with your answers. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, I want to thank uh, Moira and the Tai for all of the skill with which you held the space this evening. Um, you might be headhunted more for other debates south of the border in the future, who knows, but um, you've done a lovely job in, I think... Uh, creating, I hope not, <laughs> but thank you. Creating, creating a, a space for each of the candidates here who are standing for election to engage meaningfully with each other in the topic. So thanks to you and the support of the TAI. Um, and thanks um, uh, to, um, to all of, of all that you've brought. Um, Brenda and um, Ingrid um, spoke so eloquently and clearly earlier, and, and they are in so many ways um, working alongside many agencies who are tirelessly uh, working to respond to the opioid overdose crisis, uh, respond to preventing suicide, responding to homelessness, poverty, uh, marginalization, and um, uh, to hold up our hands too, to all of, the, all of the healthcare workers, community social service workers, really, really doing fantastic, fantastic work. Thank you very much indeed uh, for being here this evening. Um, and a final thank you to the, my team at CMHABC and, and Amelia and others for stitching together what I think has been a fantastic evening. 
and our viewers. We had um, a significant number. We, I think, trailed up to um, over 150 people at one point in this evening tuning in. Tonight was democracy in action. It was an opportunity for great questions and debate. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. And I think as each of the candidates spoke um, about, um, this evening is um, an opportunity and it has been an opportunity to push back stigma. We've, we've shone a brighter light on issues um, that 20, 30 years ago would not be discussed in such an open forum. And it's testament to everyone involved this evening, including our candidates, uh, for being part of that stigma reduction um, to, to speak so openly about mental health and substance use and addiction. So on behalf of the Canadian Mental Health Association, BC, um, and the board of directors and, and, and the branches here. Thank you so much for joining this evening. Uh, we will uh, be posting a recording of this uh, shortly and we, we have a transcript of the comments um, and, um, and hopefully you'll stay connected um, um, throughout. Amelia, the one last thing, if you could put up the, um, just the slide for any of you who are listening in this evening um, and um, are looking for supports um, a number of these resources um, are absolutely freely available. Uh, do check out our website, cmha.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. Um, there's a whole range of resources there around depression, anxiety, uh, supports for parents and caregivers, um, for healthcare workers, uh, do check it out. Um, and we also provide listings of many allied agencies who are, who are doing such important work to um, support mental health and well-being at this very, very difficult time. That's it from me, 902, not bad, hey? Thank you very much indeed. And we will say goodbye and sign off for this evening. Take care.